Good afternoon. My name is Rosie Alsop. I am Communications Director at Guernsey Finance, the promotional agency for Guernsey's financial services sector. And I am delighted to be in conversation this afternoon with William Mason, who is the Director General of the Guernsey Financial Services Commission, the regulator for Guernsey's financial services. Uh, We'll be discussing the importance of balanced regulation to support and implement environmental benefits and actions. And we'll also be talking about the intersection between environmental and social issues. Welcome, William. Thank you. So let's start with you telling us about Guernsey and the Commission's approach to sustainability. Sure. Uh, well, Guernsey has, is a small island in between uh, France and England, and we've been self-governing with our own parliament and our own courts and laws and so forth for, oh, 800 years, so a little bit, a little bit of time. I mean, most pertinently, I think, for this audience is thinking about what we've actually been doing in the sustainability space. And there we started, I suppose, about six years ago now, with implementing a regime for trying to get people to invest more comfortably in climate positive activities. And we call that the Guernsey Green Fund framework. And we've now raised about 5.5 billion um, through that framework for investment in uh, climate positive projects, which has been very positive. And we as a regulator, we've gone out and assessed whether the fund managers were actually investing in the things which they were meant to be investing in. And we found that to a pretty large extent they have. So as it were, we as a statutory regulator provide some proof against greenwashing. Then we went on and we uh, developed something called the Natural Capital Funds Framework last year. And that was basically based on the Kuchiming Montreal uh, Convention, which was agreed at COP15 last year. And it's designed to provide, again, another statutory framework to encourage those who actually want to invest in biodiversity projects, nature positive projects, to meet the, uh, the goals of the COP15 framework, uh, to invest with the security that they're not going to be greenwashed, as it were. So that's sort of the two fund frameworks. Also in insurance, I think going back to 2020, we were one of the first, if not the first regulator, to come out with a statutory capital framework for our life insurance firms to encourage them to, uh, to invest in sustainability projects. And I do remember we were slightly laughed at by the time, why, why are you doing that? And now it's frightfully popular to alter insurance uh, capital regimes to encourage insurers to invest in sustainability projects. And I think in Guernsey, we were probably the first to, first to do that back in December 2020. But it's also about how people behave. And I think it's a big adaptation process which people have got to go through. So we changed our code of corporate governance, which applies to all the several thousand firms we regulate in Guernsey back in 2021, to ask boards to make sure that at least once a year they have a full discussion about what climate change means for them and their business models and how they're going to adapt to it, and to consider whether they should be making any uh, disclosures uh, about climate, sustainability, and so forth. Now in, Gern, in, in Guernsey, we're known as Guerns, but we're also known as donkeys. And I think it's fair to say that we prefer our carrots to our sticks, because we like being happy donkeys rather than sore donkeys. And that's what be very, very much the flavour of some of the measures we've taken in Guernsey, to nudge, to push people into thinking properly about nature and about climate change. And it's great to see such a small island taking such a pioneering approach. Now, what do you see as the biggest challenges with sustainable investing and, in your case, William, regulation? I think greenwashing is a very big challenge. And I think a lot of people thought it was a fairly simple issue. You create some regulations and it goes away and you assure it. Actually, it's not. Because if you think about what we're about, we're asking for one of the biggest civil engineering projects the world's ever seen in terms of the dash for net zero by 2050, in terms of the infrastructure, especially in emerging markets which needs to be built. That infrastructure requires a lot of minerals to be extracted and an awful lot of manufacturing. And both minerals extraction and manufacturing produce greenhouse gases and do some environmental damage much of the time. And I think there is a distinctly grey area around greenwashing as to what is, as it were, bad greenwashing, whereby you're actually just endorsing very polluting activities which aren't reforming their ways. And then 
what is positive nature investment, um, positive climate investment, because you're investing in the infrastructure which we need to achieve net zero. So there's, there's a lot of nuance there, and I think it's important that we don't let the theoretical best become the enemy of the practical good in what we do. I, mean, I was at the British Labour Party's conference last uh, in October, and there were lots of manufacturers there talking about how they plan to do lots of carbon capture activities to keep their industries in the northwest of England viable. And one thing which struck me about this was that there wasn't a lot of profitability upside for them in doing any of these things. And I think there is a distinct danger, unless the global carbon price is augmented very substantially, that we won't see we won't see the sort of change we want. We may actually end up just shutting down relatively clean industry in the developed world and outsourcing it to the emerging markets where it will be done in a less environmentally sustainable fashion and, and the West loses any chance it has of exercising benign leadership by doing that. And I think that that is potentially problematic. I also think we've got problems with SME firms. Now, the SME firms is where a lot of the innovation in the world comes from. Um, and if we clobber SME firms with very bureaucratic regulation, rather than asking them to focus on outcomes in terms of proper sustainable outcomes, we will stop them operating. And that's not at all positive. So in Guernsey, very much, we're striving for green common sense solutions because I think that's the way in which we can helpfully achieve some real and positive change, both for climate and for nature. So you've outlined some of the challenges there, but uh, let's talk about what solutions there might be on the horizon. Are there changes to be made that will make the transition easier? Yes, I think there are. That's oh, good. The, that, that, that's the good news. I think the... International Sustainability Standards Board has done a really amazing job of bringing together an alphabet soup of standards into a single global disclosure baseline for all companies. Now, that, as many of you in the audience will know, was published in June. But I think even more importantly, from a financial services regulation point of view, was IOSCO, which is the standard setter we have for, on a global basis for basically all investment firms, all investment regulation, IOSCO endorsed the standard in July, which means that there is now some global impetus to implement the standard over the next uh, few years. Now, I was, I, it's still it's a complex standard, and for those of you who've looked at it, you'll know that getting to scope three emissions, i.e. the emissions from your producers and the emissions from your customers, which are particularly critical if you're a financial services firm, is actually quite hard. And I was talking to the chair of the ISBE on Monday here, and I said, isn't it really hard getting to the scope three emissions? He said, well, actually, for the big corporates who've been practicing through the TCFD voluntary standards, they've actually got to a stage through working with their suppliers, where for a very large percentage of their uh, scope three, they can actually get it uh, relatively accurate, and they're having to model less and less of it, and more and more of it's based on real data. And with some of the real data launches which we've seen over this last week at COP, I think there is some distinct hope for the for the future there. Um, I mean, cl clearly you've had Bloomberg doing work on this, you've had Al Gore doing work on this, S&P were just telling me just now in the stands they've been doing a lot of work on it. So there's a lot of shards of light there. And there are shortcuts for SMEs in terms of carbon spend-based accounting, but we shouldn't kid ourselves that model data is often quite different from actual data, and while models can be very helpful, it's imperfect. We in Guernsey have been doing some work uh, with um, experts on whether you can use AI yet to model what your scope three carbon emissions are, and the answer is not quite. It's on its way, but it's not there yet. So I think as we go through uh, implementation of ISBE, it may be the case that various jurisdictions turn to ask for their scope one and their scope two emissions first, which are relatively easy to actually calculate. And then when you've got a couple of years data sets, you can then think about asking everybody to do the scope three ones, because you'll have, a, you'll have pu hopefully published suppliers and customers' data sets on S1 and S2 upon which to draw to be able to accurately calculate your own scope three. So I think there's, there's some quite, quite good room for hope there. That's good to hear. So what do you think about transition plans? Are they a necessary step for the transition? Um, and where do you see their limitations being? <laughs> 
Well, I think it's, it's amazing how far they've come and quite how fast, um, because I think they were only really a glint in somebody's eye two years ago. And then there's been a huge amount of evolution in thinking about that over the last uh, two years. And I think that evolution is going on. I mean, talking to some of my counterparts at the Network for Green the Financial System events on Monday, the Network for Green the Financial System is the global uh, regulators uh, green think tank, um, they were thinking about actually how they, how they should apply and when they should apply. It's still a, a lot to be, of work to be done there, but done well, I think they can offer a business a very measured path to how that business is going to, in a profitable, growing and sustainable way, get to net zero by 2050. Clearly, we can't all pretend we're going to get to net zero and then say, in, oh, 2049, oh, shouldn't we do something about it? There's got to be a measured progress plan. And if it, they can be used as a device at board level to talk about how a firm is going to get to net zero, that is a really, really positive set. But if we as regulators set too aggressive constraints on those transition plans, I think there you could actually get into the realms of negativity. For example, I was talking to one investment manager whose credentials are imp impeccably green, not a return maximizer, but really for out for social good as much as for investment return. And she was saying, if I adopt a very hard definition for my transition plans, I'm essentially saying I can do no investment in emerging markets countries because I won't have the data sets I need to be able to give the level of assurance which some people are demanding I have for my transition plans. So we need to be very careful as regulators that we, do, we implement them carefully with financial services firms so that we don't disincentivize our banks, our investment managers, our long-term insurers from investing in the really productive projects in emerging markets which can offer a huge amount of social goods, environmental benefits and help the planet. And let's remember that two-thirds of environmental emissions now come from emerging markets uh, deliver net zero. So let's talk next steps. What's next after carbon? Have you looked at other topics? Yes, we have. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier the natural capital framework, which we built on the draft out outcomes of the COP15 in uh, Montreal. And then we tweaked it slightly to fit in with the actual outcomes in COP15 in Montreal on nature conservation. I think my view and the many of other people is that nature is actually the main engine we have available for balancing gases in our atmosphere. And I think the, the economics bit is that ecosystem services uh, deliver huge benefits and so forth and drive GDP and that's all true. But I think much more critically for me is we need nature and we need biodiversity to survive as a species. And frankly, species survival always strikes me as a little bit more critical as to whether the economic growth rate goes down by one or two percentage points or fractions of a percentage point. Um, now, the trouble with nature is there's not the same financial incentives uh, for conserving nature, for biodiversity as there are for climate mitigation investments. That's why we as Guernsey slightly went out on a limb and created the Natural Capital Funds Framework as a signal that we all need to take this seriously. The UK has done some work on biodiversity credits, but they aren't as much use um, globally as all the signals which have been being put in place to conserve nature. I remember one of the hardest conversations I had at COP15 last year was with the head of finance at the Gabonese finance ministry. And she said to me, look, William, we've got the best conserved tropical rainforest in Africa, but nobody is paying me for that. I would get far more money if I cut down that rainforest and then replanted it, which would do untold environmental harm. Now, we need to avoid those perverse incentives. I mean, we as Guernsey, um, as the Guernsey Financial Services Commission, we've planted woodland in Scotland to offset our environmental emissions, our un unavoided environmental emissions, so that hopefully in a very few short years, certainly before the end of the decade, we will be entirely a carbon neutral organisation. But in that planting, we made very sure that we were doing an ecologically friendly planting because it's all very too easy to meet some CO2 emissions goals to put up an awful lot of Sika spruce, which in much of the Northern Hemisphere is the most reliable wood for forestry. And yes, it will do a good job of absorbing carbon. 
But if you've ever walked through a Sika spruce forest, they're totally dead zones. There's no biodiversity. All other life is wiped out by them. So in our planting as the commission, we've gone from really environmentally diverse uh, way of doing it. But we need to do so much more in that. The Das Gupta report famously highlighted the $500 billion of subsidies against nature. And for too long, in all our productive activities, we as humans have treated nature as a free good. And we've seen diversity decline by half in my lifetime. We can't afford to go on long like that. I think we need to be very careful in things like uh, wood chip boilers and in the use of bio biofuels, that we don't actually create perverse incentives to destroy yet more of, of nature to produce, to produce supposedly carbon neutral fuels but which actually have very negative consequences both for biodiversity and nature if they're not handled very sensibly. So I think we're allowed to overrun by a couple of minutes. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Any other messages for the audience today? Well, I sort of regard um, the, the quest for net zero as a bit like a, a mountaineering expedition. There's a very high mountain like K2 or Everest to climb up and I've been up at COP, uh, at COP today, and we've seen all the slogans for become an actionist, and I have this picture in my mind of these people um, with their crampons on, their ice axes out, their ropes slung over their shoulders, and they're going up their cliff faces, questing for the top of this mountain. But I look at them and I say, yes, we need people like you, but you've got to be realistic. Most of humanity is not going to be like you. And I think the challenge for those of us involved in regulation, following political directions, is to actually think about how we can create a, a road and a very well-engineered well road up that mountain. Now that road's going to have its hairpin bends, it's going to have its difficult passes, it's going to have its tunnels, but we've got to create a road which makes it easy for ordinary working people to get towards net zero. We've seen in the Netherlands yes, this year and last year with the rise of the Bebebe, the Farmers' Party, and we've seen with the European People's Party voting against some uh, nature finance regulations in the European Parliament, how thin the support is for the quest for net zero. And I think it's very incumbent on technocrats like me and my colleagues to chart a very sensible, commonsensical path up that mountain, which most people can walk up, and which you can drive your electric car up without it falling off, without it bursting into flames. And we shouldn't underestimate the real world opposition there is if people are told to change their lifestyles towards a lot of the quest for net zero and for nature conservation. So I think we've got to be pragmatic, we've got to engineer well, and be very sensible so that we don't let the best, the theoretical best, the enemy of the practical good, and that's certainly what we're working towards in Guernsey. It's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you today, William. Thank you so much, and thank you for listening.